Welcome to the first new episode of 2017. In this week's program, we take a closer look at the language of the luxury industry. Those unique terms and words used by the purveyors of the high life to describe their products and services and differentiate these from the mass market. Ever wonder what those buzzwords are all about? Well, we have them all in our lexicon of luxury. An alphabetical list of terms and, well, marketing jargon used by the most elusive and exclusive establishments and the most expensive and elitist brands in the world. So join us as we break it all down from A to Z in our lexicon of luxury. I'm Davis Aldran and this is Executive Clocks. All right, let's begin from the very top, the letter A. And if there's one word we've been hearing so much of these days, it's artisanal. Yes, these days the A word is used to describe and justify the price of almost anything produced by the luxury industry. Strictly speaking, artisanal stands for things made in a traditional or non-mechanized way. Ideally by a skilled artisan, using his own hands and guided by generations old knowledge. Simply put, anything made before the Industrial Revolution was considered artisanal, though no one back then bothered to pay extra for it. How to tell if it's a real thing? See if these are really produced by hand and in small batches, following a traditional method that's historically acknowledged, otherwise you've just been had. Today, restaurateurs have adopted the term as well to describe the food and products sourced from small farms and producers, and the dishes the work of artisans, meaning their cooks and chefs. B is for bespoke. It's a fancy way of saying custom-made, really. Back in the time of our great-grandparents, Almost everything they wore was bespoke, but today we willingly pay a premium for it. For shirts, suits, and shoes especially. That's because no two men are ever alike, not even twins. The factory-produced clothes of big brands may be much cheaper and their styles more current, but nothing quite beats the comfort and fit of clothing measured, made, and tweaked over and over again just for you, and nobody else but you. Next is C for connoisseur or connoisseurship, which is easier said than spelled. It's derived from the 18th century French term connoist, which is to know, thus someone in the know. In luxury terms, someone who understands and is deeply passionate about something beyond the reach of most, like fine wine, sports cars, or rare timepieces. There's a condition these snobs impose, however. You can't be a connoisseur unless you consume or collect the subject of your connoisseurship. Otherwise, you're not a real connoisseur, just a poseur. Let's go to D. D is for déclassé, which is what happens when exposed as a poseur. It's yet another French term, this one meaning to be removed from one social class. It's that sinking feeling the entitled have when told by the stewardess to turn right when boarding, after getting so used to making a left to business or first class on a plane. Yep, a class A means you've just been literally downgraded a class, economy class. Exclusive is the most commonly used e-word in the luxury industry, and brands like Hermès of Paris have built an empire on that promise. The Birkin bag, which starts at about 10,000 US dollars and takes about six months to order, is one of the best examples of how much people are willing to spend and wait for a handbag. Yes, a handbag. Of course, a Birkin is no ordinary handbag. 
It's so exclusive it covers the ABCs of luxury. A. Artisanal. It's handcrafted by artisans in France. B. Bespoke. You can customize the color and type of leather. And C. It's definitely a collectible piece, worthy of connoisseurship. And yes, even D. De classe. If you're caught sporting around a triple A fake. While we're on the topic of a Parisian brand, let's make the French term flaneur our top word for F. A flaneur is an urban wanderer, privileged enough so that he may go about exploring the avenues of the most interesting cities of the world in the most carefree manner. No surprise then that the image of the flaneur was invented in the streets of 19th century Paris. Paris's interconnected squares, sidewalks, keys and arcades provide the ideal streetscape for the flaneur, whom the French poet Charles Baudelaire described as having no occupation in life but to chase along the highway of happiness. Now that's what we call luxury. And speaking of cityscapes, our G word is gentrified, or that process by which poor immigrant and working class neighborhoods transform into the playgrounds and enclaves of the rich. Singapore's Chinatown is a familiar example of this. Once cramped, filthy, and crime ridden, these shop houses were considered déclassé and have since been gentrified to become the favorite watering hole of expats and local elite. Classified as architectural heritage, the shop houses are preserved by the government and leased out to entrepreneurs who have converted these cultural landmarks into hip hotels, upscale bars, and head offices of Singapore's creative class. The letter H is next, and that refers to haute horlogerie, the French term insiders of the watch world use to describe the market segment known as high watchmaking. Unless you want to embarrass yourself, note that watches in the art or luxury category are not always the same as luxury watches, even if a luxury watch is always considered art or luxury. Confused? Well, a luxury watch is so called because perhaps it's a pricey watch from a familiar luxury brand. But if it isn't handcrafted, or if its movement isn't made in house, or complex enough, then it does not qualify as haute horlogerie. An elegant 2000 US dollar plus Longines watch can be called a luxury product by some, but hardly anyone would call it haute horlogerie, in the same way a Breguet watch is. The use of precious metals and jewelry is one obvious difference, but more so the watchmaking skills required. Breguet timepieces are decorated and engraved by hand with a mechanical movement that's developed and crafted in-house. As such, they can't be mass-produced and usually come only in limited editions. Only few elite brands qualify as art or luxury. Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, the Vacheron Constantin. You get what I mean. After H, we move to I. I is for insider, as in insider knowledge that creates insider experiences. Luxury travel is no longer just about flying first class or staying at a five-star hotel. It's now about access to stuff, to people, to moments only few do, access to the best kept secrets. Like when in Budapest, that means skipping the high street shops and instead having shoes made by the same family that handcrafts pairs for European royalty. Or when in the island of Patmos, steering away from the tourist traps for a table in a working class tavern that's frequented by Michelin starred chefs. Or sharing insights over a drink with an award winning playwright in Prague. Or driving across the beautiful southern Italian landscape in a sports convertible.
The list of insider experiences goes on and on, including our next choice for the letter J. J for Jet Set. Half a century ago, that meant being a frequent flyer. But with the advent of budget carriers, Jet Set evolved to mean flying first class. However, with check-in and security procedures stricter than ever, these days, even first class is no longer good enough. A private jet is the new standard. The cabin, the amenities, the full flat beds, they're not too different from first class. Here's the main difference. An entire plane, crew, an itinerary that's entirely your own, meaning you can fly non-stop, direct, to practically any point on the map. It's the ultimate expression of freedom and travel, the new definition of what it means to be part of the Jet Set class. Moving on to K, K is for King. The term King is used to emphasize anything that's superlative or at the top of a product category. For example, Rolex is the king of watches, Hamon Iberico the king of port, and Bordeaux the king of wine. The reference to kings can also be literal, as in products that are known to have been used by kings, tsars, or emperors, and other royalty. Rolls Royce will always be associated with the royals that rode in their cars, and Breguet with the kings and queens that wore their watches. Even luxury cognac producers Hennessy and Remy Martin use the memory of famous monarchs to help peddle their tempo. Remy Martin's flagship cognac, the Louis XIII, is not only named after the 17th century French king, even the shape of the decanter takes after a similar one owned by the powerful Bourbon king. Not to be outdone, Hennessy's own exclusive line of cognac, the Paradis Imperial, takes after a formula close to the same cognac produced by the House of Hennessy for Alexander I, Tsar of Russia. And that's the first 11 letters of the alphabet. 15 more to go before we get to Z. Our lexicon of luxury returns after the break.